He breathed upon them and said to them, Receive the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Words taken from St. John's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When our dearest Lord was just an infant, the evil king, Herod, sent soldiers to massacre all the baby boys of Bethlehem in order to kill the newborn king. But through the message of an angel and the obedience and, yes, the courage of good St. Joseph, the Christ child, and his virgin mother were protected as the Holy Family fled into Egypt. And on this flight into that demonic country of sin, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph entered a forest inhabited by murderous thieves, And among these thieves was a criminal called Dismas. In the depths of his dark soul, however, lay some secret graces that he had not yet refused. Hidden from sight and awaiting an unsuspecting victim, Dismas saw the approach of a man, a young woman, carrying a baby. The three travelers had some baggage as well as some of the gifts to the child by the three kings. Dismas judged that this unprotected group would not offer resistance. The staff of St. Joseph caused him no fear, and Dismas advanced to harm them. His greedy eyes, however, fell upon the child Jesus, and he stopped. Dismas marveled at the glorious beauty and, yes, majesty of the holy face of the Son of God and Son of Mary. Deeply touched, he protected the travelers instead of harming them. And then he provided shelter for them by bringing the holy family to his cave. This was the means that divine providence would use to help Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. But in this case, it would not be a pure spirit that would intervene, but rather a thief and a murderer who, for a moment at least, was transformed into a good and helpful angel. Now, Dismas offered everything he had to the Holy Family, and the divine infant allowed himself to be caressed by that criminal. Upon seeing the respect of the thief for the child, the Blessed Mother solemnly promised Dismas that he would be rewarded for his merciful kindness before his death. Dismas continued his life of crime, but he always kept the memory of that promise, trusting that it would one day be fulfilled. More than 30 years later, Dismas would once again appear upon the scene, along with Justus, another thief, carrying his cross to be crucified on Mount Calvary, with Jesus Christ. Dismas's life of thievery and murder, however, had so darkened his soul that he recognized neither Jesus nor Mary. Three crosses were raised on Mount Calvary, and from the hours of 12 noon to 3 p.m., Dismas witnessed the blasphemies aimed at Jesus by the multitudes. Dismas, in fact, joined in the blasphemies at first. The mocking crowds represented the entire world. And yes, the two thieves on the right and to the left of our Lord represented the entire human race, who in Adam and Eve, the first thieves of all, had clearly stolen the forbidden fruit. But Our Lady Our Lady, looking at the thief to the right of her divine son, recognized Dismas and remembered his former act of kindness and mercy. The mother of the Savior, therefore, began to pray for him. And as the hour of divine mercy approached, the long shadow of Jesus' cross fell upon the body of Dismas. And at that moment, the bad thief, Justus, who would come to represent the reprobate, shouted, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But as that cross and its shadow fell upon the heart of Dismas, he responded differently 
stating to his partner in crime, do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? For we are justly and deservedly, we have received those things which we endure, but he has done no evil. After these words said with great contrition, the thief transformed into a good thief by grace, pronounced a sublime act of faith. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. At this moment, Jesus fulfilled the promise made by Our Lady at the foot of the cross. Jesus fulfilled that promise before Dismas died. Dismas then recognized Our Lady at the foot of the cross. The good thief, purified by the sacrifice of Christ, received a share in the fruits of the redemption, and he became a saint. Saint Dismas is considered the patron saint of all those condemned to death, the patron saint of those engaged in dishonest business who would like to make restitution before they die. St. Dismas is also the patron for great sinners and prodigal sons of those near despair because of irresolvable situations. St. Dismas also assists souls in order that they may not die in final impenitence. Now, this wondrous story comes to us from the writings of the great scholastic and doctor of the church, namely St. Anselm. Yes, here we have St. Anselm providing the history of a soul, that of St. Dismas. In the soul of the good thief, a contradiction existed. The man was raised among criminals and received the worst of all possible influences. Nevertheless, Dismas also received the grace to carry out God's will, because grace is lacking to no one. The soul had gone astray on a bad path. Nonetheless, since his childhood, says St. Anselm, Dismas was faithful to some secret graces. St. Anselm presents the history of a man who had sinned much, but in whom God had a mysterious design of mercy and maintained it despite Dismas' criminal activity. Dismas committed all kinds of atrocities, but in the depths of his being, he kept a secret hope alive that in the end he would repent, be forgiven, and see a new road open to him. St. Dismas is important for all of us especially in our wretched condition. Our past sins and the temporal punishments due to those sins weigh heavily upon our souls. Our continued habitual failings in the spiritual life and moral life cause us to question at times our very salvation. And yet, with all our misery... We can say to St. Dismas, you were as bad as I am, or even worse. So I beg you to attain for me the mercy you received. You know quite well the moral abyss of a sinful life. Therefore, have pity on me and take me under your protection. Win for me the grace of a good death. St. Dismas is a saint for all of us in our darkest moments. In those moments when we think that living a true life of virtue is impossible. He is a saint for those in this modern world filled with countless prodigal children who have distanced themselves from God. But our dearest Lord chose Dismas as a symbol of his mercy. He made St. Dismas a lifelong criminal, the first canonized saint in history. As one Catholic writer put it, by means of St. Dismas, our Lord says to all Catholics, my mercy is greater 
than you can possibly calculate and goes beyond anything you can imagine. If you trust and hope in this mercy, you will be saved as Dismas was. Mercy. Mercy goes beyond pity. It surpasses just feeling sorry for somebody. Yes, mercy is compassionate, and yes, it is sympathetic, but it puts this feeling into practice. Mercy, therefore, is a ready willingness to help anyone in need, especially those in need of pardon and reconciliation. Mercy is an act of love that feeds the hungry, that actually gives a drink to a thirsty man. Mercy is active for provides relief with clothing, shelter, visitations, and even burying the dead. And yes, mercy performs actively spiritual works as well by seeking to convert the sinner, as well as instructing those who are ignorant of the true faith and proper moral behavior. Mercy also comforts those in sorrow and counsels those in doubt, all while praying for the living and the dead. Mercy may meet a broken person where they are, but mercy does not want to keep or maintain that person where they are, in that sorrowful state. True mercy works to solve problems and to relieve sufferings. It does something. By way of analogy, a physician seeks to bring healings and cures to those patients with diseases. In fact, it would be merciless if a doctor were to keep a sick man in his sickness, all while assuring him that he was just fine in his illness, allowing a man's wounds to fester, allowing his cancer to grow and grow, allowing infections to develop without providing any proper medicine, would actually be nothing less than malpractice. And so with priests and with parents, mercy obliges them to be instruments in bringing their spiritual and natural children out of a life of sin and into the life of grace and knowledge of the true faith. Mercy brings those who are distant from God closer to him by removing obstacles to union with the divine. If priests, parents, relatives, or friends were to affirm their loved ones in their sin, accepting their immoral behavior or embracing their illicit activities, then they would be exhibiting a false mercy and a pseudo-compassion. In fact, it would be the height of spiritual malpractice for a Catholic to accept and condone the behavior of Justus, the bad thief, when true mercy wondrously transforms criminals into men like St. Ismus who stole heaven at the last moment. Now, in recent months, we have heard much talk about compassion coming from certain people, including high-ranking figures within the church. We've been told that Catholics have to be far more pastoral in their approach and not so dogmatic, demanding, and unmerciful, supposedly, in dealing with the problems of habitual sin or with living arrangements against the laws of God. A document released by the Synod on the Family back in October of last year, for example, speaks of the goodness, the goodness that can be found in the lives of cohabiting couples who practice the marital act without actually being married. Furthermore, the document stated that the divorced and remarried can exhibit an authentic family life with elements of sacrifice and generosity. And in a striking and very novel section of the document called Welcoming Homosexuals, it states the following, quote, 
Homosexuals have gifts and qualities to offer to the Christian community. The document then asks, are we capable of welcoming these people, guaranteeing to them a fraternal space in our communities? Often they wish to encounter a church, the document continues, that offers them a welcoming home. Are we, as communities, capable of providing that, accepting and valuing their sexual orientation? Without compromising, of course, Catholic doctrine on the family and matrimony. The scandalous statement then concludes, without denying the moral problems connected to homosexual unions, it has to be noted that these are cases in which mutual aid to the point of sacrifice constitutes a precious support in the life of the partners, unquote. Such praise, mind you, such praise is heaped upon these individuals that one wonders if it would just be easier to stay in their particular situation, seeing that there's such goodness present there anyway. It's not surprising, then, that one bishop called this document neo-pagan and the worst ever written in the entire history of the Roman Catholic Church. Cardinal Burke, who many of you are aware of, commented on this unfortunate document with the following words. Quote, If you are living publicly in a state of mortal sin, there isn't any good act that you could perform that justifies that situation. The person remains in grave sin. We believe that God created everyone good and that God wants the salvation of all men, but that can only come about by conversion of life. The cardinal concludes, and so we have to call people who are living in these gravely sinful situations to conversion and to give the impression that somehow there's something good about living in a state of grave sin is simply contrary to what the church has always and everywhere taught. Finally, I would like to add that it is also a merciless document, unworthy of the Catholic Church, for it turns our merciful mother into an indulgent and lax parent who cares little about removing sin and bringing about reconciliation. I grant you that we must take people where they are, even in their fallen and weak condition. But let's not leave them there. A gradual return to the way of Christ might be in order for certain individuals as they slowly but surely leave the wide path and eventually find the narrow way. Priests must be lions in the pulpit we are called to defend doctrine and the moral law of God. But they should also be gentle lambs at times in individual and private cases as they seek to direct, persuade, and encourage persons who may be stuck in a particular difficult situation. But such gradualism, step by step, does not apply to the law of Christ. The Ten Commandments is not ideal for only some, but rather the Ten Commandments has to be followed by everybody on earth. Furthermore, a gradual return to Christ can present certain dangers, knowing that there is such urgency in our Lord's call to repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. St. Paul says, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. In addition, St. Paul says those things to encourage us to step it up in terms of our conversion of life. A thief was mercifully transformed to a saint by the prayers of Our Lady and the grace of Christ. 
This same merciful transformation is offered to all of us if only we would take advantage of it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.